Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are in the world. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to the third and final session of our Apex Yes Yacht Early Career Workshop on Polar Prediction and Collaboration in the Arctic. Please be aware that this session is going to be video recorded. If you don't want to appear in the video, then be sure to have your camera off at all times. Uh, we're going to be making the recording available through Apex so that early career researchers who weren't able to attend um, the conference will be able to benefit from the presentations and discussions. I'll ask you to all please mute your microphone uh, at all times, unless you are invited to unmute and ask a question. Um, it'll be great if you could also turn your camera on when you're speaking, just so we can see who we're talking to. Uh, please use the chat box to put in any questions for the speakers. Um, and uh, it'll be great to know who's on the call. So please do make sure that you, you've got your name uh, shown in Zoom. So in this, our final session, we're offering an overview of some of the key activities associated with the Year of Polar Prediction efforts and some of the yacht endorsed projects in the Arctic and North Atlantic. And um, through a series of rapid five minute talks, uh, the presenters are going to introduce a variety of the YOP activities, showcase some of the available uh, meteorological data sets and how you can access them. And we're going to conclude the session by highlighting some different ways in which early career researchers can contribute and get involved with YOP and the data sets coming out of the poll prediction project. So with that, I'd like to invite our first speaker, Thomas Hochau from the Alfred Wegener Institute. And Thomas is going to be telling us about, a bit more about the Mosaic School on board the Russian vessel Academic Fedorov, uh, which we heard a little bit about yesterday, and how 20 early career researchers engaged in making the school and how they um, contributed to the successful setup of the distributed network around College Dam. Over to you, Thomas. Yeah, um, thank you. I, I hope you can see my screen and uh, can hear me nicely. That's, that's great. Thank you. Thank okay, you. good. Um, yeah, so thank you for um, having me here, actually. So I'm, I'm quite uh, honored to um, talk about the Mosaic School. And uh, yeah, so my talk is called Lectures on Shaky Ground because we were based in a ship in the Arctic Ocean. And I want to give you a short insight into that. Um, so yeah, you are quite familiar with the uh, mission of the Year of Polar Prediction. And uh, yeah, one... Um, Educational activity was actually the uh, Mosaic School, where I was uh, um, the, the lecturer uh, um, by Job for giving a modeling uh, lecture on the ship. And that's why I also want to thank the uh, WMO for making this uh, possible. Um, and here on the right, you can see uh, yeah, why I called uh, the presentation like that. So it was very shaky during the transit to the Arctic Ocean. You can see the horizon going up and down. So not only for physical work, but also for giving lectures and actually concentrating on listening to lectures. This was quite challenging also for the um, uh, early career researchers um, joining us. Yeah, so here um, another major goal of the Mosaic School was to set up the distributed network around Polarstern on the ice. Here on the right, you can see um, the two ships joining each other in the Arctic. And on the left, you can see a short insight into um, how the early career scientists helped to set up everything on the ice. So all the heavy equipment, they also were operating the crane and putting everything on uh, Nansen sledges and so on. So that was very helpful. And also our cruise leader, he said that actually the early career scientists, they were the integrating element uh, to make, to make um, this a success, the setup of the uh, distributed network. So how, um, this is how it turned out. Uh, we, um, we managed to put a lot of instruments on these large uh, L and M sites around Polarstern. So it was uh, smaller flows. And um, my personal highlight was also to put a, a YOP buoy in, in a gap of the observational uh, network. So it's a positional GPS buoy. Um, yeah, that was kind of also my personal highlight. Here I want to quickly um, highlight that um, there are a lot of lectures available on the Apex webinars website at uh, Vimeo. Um, so you probably uh, remember here the logo of my title slide where you can see um, the atmosphere, sea ice and ocean components of Mosaic, but it also covers um, the ecosystem and biogeochemistry. And there are quite nice lectures here uh, in a very authentic setting. So you see it's sometimes also shaking and so on. Uh, so maybe you can check it out if you're interested. 
one aspect also that I was covering in my uh, lecture on uh, modeling was Arctic uh, sea ice leads that appear in high resolution simulations. And you can see here an animation um, with sea ice cracks and leads appearing. And now the question is, of course, uh, whether there's an influence also on atmospheric forecasts and uh, whether this is a, has an influence not just on weather, but maybe also on climatic timescales. Another aspect actually where I'm quite proud is that uh, the early career scientists, they managed to um, provide daily weather forecasts on the ship, which is very challenging, you can imagine, because uh, the internet connection on an, on an Arctic icebreaker is quite uh, poor. But still, we managed to use um, data from the uh, German weather service and also from ECNWF to produce weather forecasts. And actually, I think almost all of the um, early career scientists once they um, presented the weather. So they were looking also at sea level pressure maps and so on. And it was quite nice to see the progress also, although they came from quite diverse backgrounds, but I think they all have uh, some idea now how this is working. Also, the second thing that we did, we produced a kind of forecasting product for the uh, distributed network. So we did this kind of from scratch while being in the Arctic, which is quite the um, yeah, uh, um, yeah, quite, which is quite quite challenging, of course, because uh, we just had some some laptops and Python scripts and so on. But still, we managed to kind of nicely forecast polar stands position and also uh, all the positions of the um, distributed uh, network. So all the other instruments on the, on the sea ice. Here in, in this colorful plot, you see um, the forecast from our script. And here, this round inset is um, actual observed positions of polar stern uh, over, uh, I think, a range of three days. So that was quite nice to see, and we can see where this is going. So I'm now coming to an end. Um, I want to use the opportunity also um, to tell you that you can also engage not just scientifically, but you can also um, yeah, engage in a creative way with your so there's the Polar Prediction newsletter, um, where often graphics and art is shared in the art and science um, project, you can say. So if you have something that one could use for illustrating the next issue of this newsletter, then yeah, we would be very happy to see that. And you can send it to office at uh, polarprediction.net. This can also be um, crazy things like a TikTok video or so. So we are also looking with uh, with Kirstin Werner, considering that TikTok might be an option also where Job could be active. And so I want to warn you now, there might be music if this works. Um. So maybe you, you get the idea, we combine music and um, climate data, and I think um, this could be quite interesting also to, um, to engage other communities that we are usually engaging. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas. I think we're raising the quality of science communication. <laughs> yeah. Does anyone have any questions for Thomas? In the meantime, um, sorry, I've got a bit of an echo to your computer. Um, how many people were seasick during the lectures on, on the mosaic school? No, sorry, can you repeat that? How many, how many, people, were... how many people ended up being seasick during lectures? Uh, yeah, I, I see. So um, actually quite, quite many people. Yeah, so they were um, yeah, out, out on the ship and trying to get some fresh air. It can be very difficult. So luckily, I I wasn't too um too affected. I was I was lucky, but it can happen to anyone. Also, to persons regular going, actually, you you you're affected or not. So you can be lucky or. <laughs> or yeah. And uh, did you do you have any advice on how to how early career researchers might engage with TikTok? Um. Yeah, it's actually a good question because I'm I'm not that uh, I'm I'm quite new to the platform myself. So it's just uh, some days now, but um, 
yeah, I, I think that there are some hashtags like like PhD, PhD life and so on, uh, which are actually helpful. So you get some uh, not just uh, stupid videos, but actually also some helpful advices for how you can finish your PhD in, in time and so on. Um, yeah, that's my, my, my idea about that. Well, thanks very much, Thomas. Um, if anyone else has got any more questions, then please do put them in the chat and we'll try and address them towards the end of the, um, the workshop. But now I'd like to invite our next speaker, Irina Sandu from the European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecasts. And so Irina is a member of the uh, Poor Prediction Project Steering Group um, and also very active in the applicant project. And she's going to be telling us about um, uh, how synergistic investments, uh, investments in observing systems and all the different components of numerical weather prediction systems are absolutely essential in order to improve predictions in the Arctic and beyond. Over to you, Irina. Hello, um, it's a pleasure to um, be here and talk, um, give you a few highlights of why um, um, and how we can improve predictions in the Arctic and beyond. Uh, do you see my screen in full screen? Yes, that looks great. Um, so this is um, really during uh, the year of polar prediction that Thomas just mentioned during a European project called Applicate, there was a lot of work to try to better understand the specific challenges posed by the Arctic in, for um, polar prediction and uh, what are the prospects for improving them. Um, so I'm just going to give you a very brief introduction of uh, um, why we should improve and how we should improve predictions in the Arctic and beyond. Um, and um, perhaps in I have to take out from these five minutes just two key messages. The first one would be that weather forecasts have really improved tremendously in recent decades. They suffer, um, they um, experienced what we call a quiet revolution and really due to improvements in all um, components of numerical weather prediction systems, which is numerics, um, data simulation, physics, use of observations and due to supercomputing. However, for the Arctic, um, what this graphic is showing you is that the skill of weather forecasts, just um, this is a measure of um, the forecast skill five days ahead. And the forecasts have improved both in the Arctic and in the North Hemisphere, but you can see that in the Arctic it remains lower. And the reason for which it remains lower is that there are really specific challenges in all these components of numerical weather prediction systems. And the year of polar prediction has uh, help tackling some of these uh, challenges through a targeted plan. Just to give you a few ideas of some of these challenges and how they were tackled, in terms of modeling challenges, think, for example, of these moist air intrusions um, from the mid latitudes in the Arctic, which brings the, these really uh, warm episodes into the Arctic, and that encompasses a lot of scales, from very large pheno scale phenomena to very small scales like stable boundary layers and clouds. What is also different um, in the Arctic, uh, what also is a specific challenge is the couple between the atmosphere, the snow, and the sea ice, the sea ice and the ocean, um, which encompasses again different scales and specific challenges in terms of models, but modeling, but also of, of initialization. And one thing, for example, which was done in Applicate was really to not both do modeling work, for example, improve certain components. And this is just an example of uh, trying to improve the representation of snow in the European Weather Center uh, model, um, but also doing accompanying that targeted diagnostic using observations at super sites like um, a super site called Sodanki Line, Finland. So what we have done in Applicate, for example, is both to improve the representation of snow, instead of representing the whole snowpack with one dot, this is what this profile, uh, this profile is showing you, the, um, the basically the temperature in the air through the snow layer in the soil. And if you present this snowpack with one single layer, you will have one dot here, the green dot, while the observations show you that there is a very strong gradient in the in the um, um, in the snow layer pack. So we present instead the snow with five layers, which is what we try to do. You can see you better capture these gradients. 
um, and whether the weather forecasts have generally a very warm bias um, in, um, in the Arctic region, if you give, have this representation of snow, you can really, for the right reasons, as we showed um, by looking at observations, you can reduce this bias um, by a considerable amount, which is what you see here. So really, in Europe, a one for one dedicated effort was to do targeted diagnostics and model evaluation to inform model development. And the second component really of um, a second um, very important component of weather prediction systems is really the observations and how we use them to, uh, to initialize the forecast by blending the observations with very strange forecasts. And there what we've done as well is to look at how what observations we have in the Arctic, and the Arctic is quite sparse in terms of radons and surface pressure observations, but is really quite um, rich in terms of satellite observations, as this plot show you. This plot just show you the number of observations used in the ACMWF system um, in the um, in uh, in the stratosphere or the troposphere, or these are the surface-based observations. And what found out really is that there are positive and statistically significant impact of Arctic observations or forecasts, not only in the Arctic, um, but also in the mid-latitudes, but there are challenges regarding to their use. And for example, during winter, we assimilate much less observations, make much use, much less of use of observations over snow and sea ice. And that is because of challenges in modeling, in data assimilation, in, and how we use these observations. So basically what we've done up is look at the specific challenges in the Arctic, um, try to advance in different, in, in, um, in different respects related to the key components of the NWP systems, which are enhanced couple modeling, data assimilation uh, techniques, and a uh, use of observations. And I'll just leave this slide on um, with a few written conclusions while I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks very much, Irina. Um, does anybody have any questions that they would like to add in the chat or um, maybe raise your hand if you'd like to ask uh, personally? Um, perhaps while people are thinking, Irina, I'll, I'll ask. It seems that in order to make really good weather predictions, you need a lot of data. Are multinational projects the way forward to be able to really understand what's happening in the Arctic or is what is the approach that we need to take? Yes, definitely. I mean, um, um, not only from observations point of view, but also from the modeling point of view, because many weather and climate models, they share the same elements um, and therefore the same challenges. Um, and um, coordinate efforts like were done in the framework of year for, of polar predictions or several uh, European projects really did help um, for bringing the community together to focus on a few specific questions um, and tackle them together because it's much easier to advance together than it is um, to advance separately and duplicate efforts. Um, what advice do you have for early career researchers who want to uh, become you know, more cold prediction experts? Like what is the path we should be taking? I think it's um, it's an exciting time. The interest in polar regions, due to um, in particular due to um, the challenges related to climate change, you know, and the ch changes experienced by the Arctic, it's a good time to work polar prediction. Um, it's an important topic. There are important challenges to be tackled, and um, there are exciting avenues for advancing in various ways, um, which have laid and be laid by the, um, and put forward by the polar prediction. So there are many interesting questions to work on, and I think um, it will be rewarding because there is a lot of interest in the community on this topic. Thanks very much, Irina. If anyone does have any questions, then please you add them into the chat and we can um, answer them uh, later on in the session. Uh, but now I'd like to invite our next speaker, Gunilla, to start sharing her screen. So Gunilla Svensson is from the Department of Meteorology at Stockholm University. And Gunilla leads the YOP site MIP task team for the Year of Polar Prediction. And this is um, a task team that oversees a coordinated process-based model evaluation project of so-called super sites that I'm sure she'll explain soon. Thank you. Over to you, Gunilla. Um, I think I need to, to unmute oh. me and you need to turn my cameras on. Oh, thank you very much for inviting me to give this little presentation here of what job site MIP is. And uh, well, first, maybe we should just then figure out what it is. And let's see if I can move my slide here. Something is wrong. There we go. 
Okay, so YOP site map is an acronym that has three parts in it. So it's YOP, the year of polar prediction, and we and it's a two year plus actually the mosaic year is also in our project. So it's uh, becoming a many year and maybe we should just have, have it ongoing. And then we have the site and the site is a location with detailed observations that can be used to understand processes. And you saw one example earlier and I'll come back to that site, which is Sudankyli in Northern Finland that you saw in Irina's talk just um, before me. And then we had model into comparison projects and that's a tool we're using that we try to get modelers to focus on the same, same time period or the same processes, which means that we can work together and that's much more fun to, to try to get the figure out what's wrong in the models and try to help them. So your upside map is an effort to enhance the observation uptake and accelerate model development by providing easy to use, high quality, well-documented observations that can be used by modeling centers to evaluate and improve the process descriptions in models. And the whole idea is that the modelers knows what the models are doing and the observationist knows both best about the observations, but to be able to really do some progress in modeling, you need to be able to use many observations and it takes time to understand observations. So we would like these two communities to work better together. And we are doing that through identifying then different sites. And here is a map of the different sites. And you can see Sudan Kulen that has already been uh, discussed. We have it here. You have Mosaic, which is a super site that was moving in the ice. We have some icebreaker Odin expeditions. Uh, that we can also use that are otherwise we don't have so much surface observations within the Arctic Ocean. And then we have the land stations around, which many have very long time series that we can use. And we are focusing on a uh, two, one winter and one summer period first, and then the whole mosaic year. So what's special then by the uh, file? So we're trying to come up with something which is called an MODF, which is and, and MMDFs. And in the model world, we'll be, we are quite used to write things in the same format and share data. But the observations often come in very different and there are many different instruments and so on. And we'd like to have a, a, a file from the observations that match the model so it's easy to use and that for the same site, for many sites then, so we can use many sites uh, when we are evaluating the models. So it is a database where we have uh, lots of observational data written in the same format. So the temperature is the temperature in all and it's written in NetCDF, easy to read files with, with explanations. And then we like to have, and have observational files for each of these sites for the same time period. And you'll find them in the YOP database, which uh, Eustern will talk about next. So I will not spend any more time on that. And what can you do then? Well, you can take a number of models. Here we have six models. And there happens to be some really strange words in the middle here, and we should just ignore them. Uh, so we have um, six sites here. We have a time period. So this is the first special observing period in the winter time. And you can plot them then the different forecasts here. And you can see that there are, if you look in the squares first, you see that the models are doing very different things in this region here. It's, it's relatively warm, but they have very different forecasts in this period. They seem to be disagreeing a bit. And then you have these other times here when the temperature is observed temperature is really cold and the models tend to be all models tend to be warmer in this period. So by doing this collectively and looking at this and this is just one variable and one time period, you can see that there are similarities in the models and there are differences in the models and sometimes they differ with the observations. So um, what do we do then? Well, we take observations and models and we plot them for all the models. And here we now have eight models instead of six. And you can see this temperature bias. And that's partly what Irina was talking about that as that was partly uh, changed and you got a bit better in doing that while introducing the snow scheme in the IFS. But this is before the snow scheme. So there are the extra layers in the snow. So you have the model temperature here too warm in almost all the models compared to the observations on the other axis. Okay, so now we know that many models have a problem with the temperatures in cold and very cold temperatures, but you don't really know why that is. Why is it like that? Well, then you have to start thinking what is controlling the temperature at the surface. And, and then you think up some other type of, of diagnostics that you want to do. And in this case, Johnny Day at ECNWF 
he took the two meter temperature and then for the IFS to try to answer why we have this discrepancy here. He plotted the uh, observations and the model results. In this diagram where we have the temperature here and we have the uh, short wave and long wave radiation. So this, uh, the energy that comes to the surface with the temperature. And then you can see that the, the model is different and it has different sensitivities. So when you get to the really uh, cold temperatures and you have uh, the forcing here for from the long way down, you have the disagreement. So there's not enough sensitivity to the radiative forcing, which we expect the model to be able to, to capture. So these are some kind of yeah, some awesome. examples of what you can do. And I'm just ending with my last slide here. Where, yeah, where I can take any questions, but maybe I'd like to just say that this project is really about bringing the experts on the observation so they can explain them and put them in the best format and tell us, tell the modelers how good their data is. So they are easy to use for the modelers so we can progress and get advancement. Thank you very much, Ganella. Um, if anyone has any questions they'd like to ask, then please do add them in the chat or uh, make yourself known by raising your hand. Um, Ganella, I'll ask you in the meantime, how, how difficult has it been to uh, bring those two communities together so that you can gain from the expertise of both? So uh, it's, um, there is a, uh, so I think there is a big interest from both communities, especially when it comes to, to a lot of the observations. So I know that, for instance, Mosaic was really, uh, it's really motivated by, uh, by the enhancing models and, and making them better is that we need to have process understanding to be able to do to, to make models better and the observations that we have um, but it's it's an unfunded business so it's it's not uh, people there are funding to make the observations usually but not necessarily to take this next step to put them in a, in a format that can be used easily by modelers and then the models tend to use the, the observations they already have because if you're going to grow into uh, using a new data set you have to learn about all the instruments what are the biases what are the problems and so on and, and that you do once or twice and, and then you do you don't have the time to do it like any longer so i think that's that's where we are sort of trying to play this role and we i think we would have gotten a lot further with this if we had it did if we didn't have the pandemic because there is uh, we need to get people in the same room to talk about how exciting it is to actually evaluate models and find out it's like solving puzzles. It's, it's a detective work in solving puzzles. And uh, would you say that uh, the, this work that you're doing now for your site map, is this something that is then a standard that can be taken forward or does, will it take m m more funding and more projects in order to be able to get the most out of the data sets in order to use them with models going forward? So I think this is, this is a learning. And if you learn how to do it and you can do it, as I said, we started with two time periods and then mosaic, but I'm saying that if you're doing, if you have done it once and you know how to do it, it's easy to, to just extend and produce one of these uh, model uh, observing, uh, they merge observing data files from your observatory. So you can do it more often and more regularly. And I don't see any problem with extending this. If this could be the standard, so you could pick a tropical site, a site in, in mid of US and a few Arctic sites. And because models are global and you want to know if they're doing a good job in these different perspectives in all locations. And if you can do that easily, I think that would be much, uh, well, that would be good to have like process observations in many different locations. Models are global and the processes are global, so they should be working everywhere. I have a question from Moritz in the chat, and he's asking, is there also a feedback from model results to expedition planning? So determining most interesting points to sample? Yes, I think that's a very good way of using models. So we can use models. So, so there is actually a, a really good point in just collecting model data from different locations. So in job site map, I talked about the Arctic now, but we also have the Antarctic and we have the third pole, uh, a few stations. And just comparing models from these locations may motivate new observations if there are things that, that go wrong, because but we don't know. Because to, to improve a model, the first thing, if the process, you need to understand the processes first and then. So I think that that definitely motivates um, Modeling work can definitely motivate uh, observations where they need to be taken. Thanks very much, Canela. If anyone else has any more uh, questions, then please do add them in the chat and I'll try and address them towards the end. But right now I'd like to invite our next speaker, Ustein uh, Godoy from the Norwegian Meteorological Institute. 
Um, and he's going to describe the YOP, how the YOP data sets are made available through the YOP data portal, as nicely advertised by Gunilla. Thank you very much. Um, the YOP data portal is the key component of YOP legacy, and it's a way for end users, and hopefully some of the people here listening today will be some of those end users. Um, it's a way to discover all the data sets that are being generated through this year of polar prediction. Over to you, Oisin. Thank you, Claire. So uh, it's quite interesting to start with uh, the data as a legacy because the YOP data portal is built on a leg legacy starting with the International Polar Year. So that's uh, to have the, the chaining of legacies here. Um, the YOP data portal, I will just uh, bring you br briefly through the purpose and the model that we are using for this. Uh, so the purpose is to provide an overview of all the data sets that are relevant to YOP. This means that we are all both focusing on real-time data sets and archived data sets. So it's not like a bookshelf where you put a book at some point, but it's a book that is evolving as time, time passes by. We are also focusing on inter, uh, integrating the, the YOP um, data management with the WMO information system. So uh, what this means today is that we do actually extract information from the closed network of uh, WMO where they do exchange the uh, the, uh, the weather and oceanographic data, uh, and I make these data available to the scientific community that uh, do not have access to these data. And we also do try to connect with the Arctic Data Management through the SEAN IAS Arctic Data Committee. The model we are using is that it's a physically distributed network of data centers that are collaborating. So we do have a YOP data portal, but what that does is basically to link that uh, to data sets that are hosted in a number of data repositories that are um, supporting the YOP activities. On the right hand side here, you see the linkages from the YOP data portal to the WMO uh, information system. It's also linked with the WMO Global Cryosphere Watch since uh, it's based on the same technology that the GCW is using. And then we have a number of uh, data centers that are actually contributing to the, um, to the um, data portal. So the data sets are not hosted in the YOP data portal. They are hosted by these data centers that are contributing. Uh, in the model, we do consider the contributing data centers as the authoritative source for the information on the data sets. And we always serve the data from the original source in this uh, context. So um, when you want a distributed network of data centers to collaborate, then you need to standardize. You need to standardize on the data documentation and the interfaces exchanging information about the data sets between the data centers. So what Gunilla talked about here, if you want to um, intercompare a number of models, you need to harmonize the output from the models. If you want to intercompare those models with the observations, you have to harmonize the encoding of those observations. Currently, we do have all the, uh, all the uh, model output for the intercooperation experiment, and the YOP sitemap data are probably the most important content of the uh, YOP data portal. But we are currently lacking the observational data, so those are in the pipeline. So those, those are coming, uh, hopefully, uh, soon now. The uh, way the YOP data portal interacts with the surrounding world is that we harvest information from uh, the contributing data centers using a number of technologies, which is irrelevant here. We do, however, focus quite a lot on uh, standardized documentation and using uh, uh, controlled vocabularies or ontologies in order to tag the data in a proper manner so that you know everybody's speaking about it. When people speak about the temperature, you know whether it's a temperature in the ocean, in the soil, or in the in the atmosphere. You also know the units. You know the missing uh, encoding of missing values, etc. The data access is relying quite heavily on open app because then we can do streaming of data. You can integrate data directly into the uh, the analysis tools that people are using, and we do data visualization on top of uh, the WMAP as a, a web map service and open app for the non gridded uh, data. The existing functionality, uh, so it's up and running. Uh, we are using announcements and tagging for information about new data sets. Uh, and through this, you can also uh, find uh, the relevant editorial content around some of the data sets. So it's not just the uh, data catalog, but it's also some additional information on top of the data catalog. And we do have the possibility to add helper scripts so that people can actually 
if if they would like to download all the, all the data, for example, for the sitemap, and make um, a, a local copy of the data if if necessary. So the existing functionality that we have currently is that we have a metadata search where you can use logical operators, and we are relying on the um, the. Um, uh, so you can do a spatial and a temporal search. You can search on the content of the data and you can combine uh, search phrases using logical operators like and and or. So I won't go into the details of these interfaces because we are in the process of uh, uh, releasing or deploying a new uh, interface to the catalog, which uh, will be available before summer. On the right hand side here, you'll see the listing of information that you can find in the data, set, in the data catalog. You have um, uh, point measurements with a bubble and uh, the uh, bounding boxes for the uh, spatially extensive uh, data sets. Underneath, you have a listing where you can enter into further information about the data sets. So if you want further information about a specific data set, you can point on the additional information button, you get additional metadata. Uh, you can list the uh, data access elements if you like to. For example, here you can see that this, these data are available using the um, OpenDAP um, mechanism. Some of the data sets you can also download directly and you have WMS services, for example, available for some of the data. In this context, I did check out some of the data that we actually harvested from the WMO uh, information system. And this is uh, observational data at weather stations. So this is the stations, uh, station at Cat Morris GZIP. And if I push visualize, you can get an interactive uh, plotting mechanism and you can actually uh, uh, go through the data. You can create a, a plot on the fly if you like to, or you can download the data if necessary. But all these things will change. Also the functionality will be there. It will be improved functionality in the uh, next release of the system, which comes quite soon. And hopefully we will have the job site map observations uh, in the system as well quite soon. Thank you. Thanks very much, Eggston. Um, does anyone have any questions they'd like to ask about the YOP data portal and how to access any of the data in there? Um, Kirsten has just shared a, a video in the chat uh, which explains how you can use the data portal if you're interested in finding out um, how to look for where a data is and what data is um, included. And um, perhaps we stand, maybe you could um, just make a comment on um, how challenging it's been to, to define the parameters of all the data sets that are coming in so that people are able to uh, give you exactly what you're looking for and that it's all standardized. So, so I, I think the, uh, when it comes to the content of information, that's the modeling group, the YUP site map group uh, that um, Gunilla has been part of. They've agreed on the parameters that we'd like to see in the, in the system. What we have been concerned about is actually adhering to this standardized interface for uh, or the documenting the data. And this is the whole foundation for the WMO uh, operational exchange of data as well. So you need to standardize. Without standardization, it's very difficult to parse all the, uh, also the large volume of observations that you actually have uh, or you, you need to process in this, this context. So uh, I think the standardization process, uh, uh, it's not been challenging. As uh, Gunilla said, uh, the modeling community has been very, also they are used to this, to standardize. For the uh, observational community, I think there has been a certain threshold, but it's also go going in the correct direction there. Brilliant, thanks very much. If anyone can think of any other questions they wanna ask them, please do add them into the chat. Um, but I'd like to, next, uh, to ask our next speaker, uh, Marvin Kanner from the University of Bergen, Norway, who will, along with uh, Jorn Christensen, also from the Norwegian Meteorological Institute, which I have to say is very well represented here today. Um, they're going to provide some insights from one of the Yacht Endorse projects, Alertness. Um, over to you, Marvin. Sorry. All right. So my name is Marvin. I'm, uh, like I said, a PhD student at the University of Bergen. And I'm affiliated with the Alertness Project. And the Alertness Project is a collaboration between weather services and academia and has a huge amount of contributors, as you can see here on the right. And the overall goal is like to enhance the uh, weather prediction for the Arctic regions. And this talk is more or less designed to like present some tools that we are using and we developed and to like reach out to this community and say, hey, we are using this, you're using something similar. Probably there can be discussions later or a general reach out at some point. 
So the alertness project uh, is basically divided into four scientific objectives, where the first one is to uh, use validation and use observations in order to verify the model very detailedly. The second one would be to improve the data assimilation that we use over the Arctic. The third one would be to enhance and improve the capabilities that we have for numerical weather prediction, which is also the, pro the part where I am most affiliated with and I will be talking about. And the fourth one is to uh, develop an ensemble prediction system for the Arctic. What all of those packages have in common is that we are working with Rome Arctic, the operational weather model that is employed by Met Norway for the European Arctic. As you can see, it is a limited area model. It is centering here at the European Arctic, has a resolution of 2.5 kilometers, focusing on Svalbard, the Nordic Seas, Barents Seas, and Northern uh, Scandinavia, more or less. And uh, especially in package three, we developed some tools that allows us to more closely investigate what the model is doing, trying to get an idea about processes that might not be represented well, and then try to, of course, fix them or at least tackle them. So the first tool that we implemented was individual tendency output. And if you think of a tendency, which just describes a change of a variable in time, you think of a prognostic tendency in our, in our model, you can roughly say a change of a variable in our model would be due to the dynamics, so the dynamical tendency, as we call them, or due to the physics, which is like the sum of all the physical parameterization schemes, which then leads us to the physical tendency. And of course, we can then, if we have an output for that, for example, we can also pick apart the different contributions to the physics, so the individual schemes, um, which would be, for example, for temperature, something like radiation, turbulence, shallow convection, and see how they actually interact, if they contribute or like they, they compensate each other, or do they like help each other out to, to uh, de de develop a certain situation or represent a certain phenomena. And for example, here, this was a convective situation. You can, for example, see that in the near surface levels, turbulence and shallow convection for temperature compensate each other, which is of course due to the different processes or like diffusive and advective that they're actually representing. We can, however, also use the tendencies, for example, to look at the whole model domain like we did here. So on the left hand side, you could, for example, see the physical tendency of temperature for the lowermost model level or for specific humidity in a cold air outbreak scenario. And then you can identify different patches or region of interest that are taking place in the model. So for example, here close to the sea ice edge, you see a strong warming and moistening, which is of course associated with the strong fluxes that you have in a cold air outbreak. But then also in other parts, you see like more distinct patterns or like areas that have like distinct distinct relationships and they are actually associated with model internal boundary layer types and these more or less help the model to represent the different processes especially the turbulent one that we have in our atmosphere and they are strongly dictating those two like shallow convection and turbulent processes which again impact the other schemes and we could find interesting uh, relationships between for example a transition in boundary layer types which is actually represented here for example between stratocumulus and shallow cumulus boundary layer types and this leads to a reduction of tendency activity so we can actually sharpen our focus to different uh, regions that uh, we see uh, might be of interest interest. The second tool is MUSK, which is the single column model version of our model. Um, we set it up as a virtual machine, so it is very easy to use for everyone. This was done by Stephen Outen from the Nansen Center, and we may basically use it for two purposes. First, we do sensitivity experiments of the microphysics in order to identify problems with low level fork, which is like a problem that we have in our system. And the second use is that uh, we implement a new turbulent length scale formulation for the stable boundary layer and the very stable boundary layer, which is primarily done by eco -ESO. As, as well at the Nansen Center, and when that is done, we're just going to take it over, or I take it over to the three-dimensional run, and then check the impacts, for example, with the tendency diagnostic. The third tool is called DDH, also very interesting. It is Diagnostics on Horizontal Domains, originally developed by Meteo France, and this allows you to define a region of interest of your model, so for example, an area or specific grid points, for example, here, Sudankula, and this then extracts or so creates a new file which puts in model output every single model time step, allowing us for like a very detailed investigation of what is happening in the model. And we can add any output variable of interest. So of course, also tendencies or whatever we are interested in. And then, for example, we are investigating the development of the stable boundary layer during the SOP of the year of polar prediction at Sudankula and seeing very detailed developments in the atmosphere. And then of course, modifying the model and seeing what is going on. 
And the first tool, which just recently came to life, are traces. So now we have passive, passive traces in our model. And I know that some other models have them some, since some time already. Uh, so we can release them at some point, and they're being affected by, by the dynamics. At some point, they will also be put, in, put into the physics. And so for now, we can actually want to use them in order to like see the accumulated impact of parameterization schemes during a forecast, like how, how does the flow come into play, and also to probably probe the water cycle that we have in the model and compare it with potentially isotope measurements that we do, for example, in Bergen or right now here at the Lofoten, where I'm seeing right now. And so with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and please have questions. Thank you very much, Marlon. Um, if anyone has any questions, then please add them into the chat or feel free to raise your hand and we'll uh, let you ask. Um, Marlon, I'll ask, uh, that looks like you've been really busy <laughs> developing quite a range of tools. Do you find there's particular areas of the model that different tools work better than others or do you need all four of the tools for to make sure the model is functioning well? Um, I for, for now, I thought that the tendency output, as you could see in that plot, was by far the one that is most uh, gives you the most education about how a model behaves, especially if you if we focus like, like on the role of the early career scientists like myself, this is very, very helpful to not only see um, what schemes do in theory, but also how they actually react. Um, so if we if we learn about if you learn about the behavior of like the K theory turbulence scheme or the mass flux shallow convection scheme, but then you actually see how they start to warm and cool the near surface layers. This is by far the most helpful and also helps to track down some interesting behavior that we can see uh, in our models. So number one would be tendencies. Thanks very much. Um, if anyone else has any questions, then please do add them into the chat and we'll, if we have any time again, we'll address them. Um, I'd like to now move on to our next speaker, um, Chris Bell from the University of East Anglia, which is actually where I went to university. Um, and Chris is going to speak about uh, another Yacht endorsed project, the Iceland Greenland Seas Project 2018. Um, he's going to describe how this project used a wide range of coordinated ocean atmosphere measurements to try to understand how the atmosphere drives ocean circulation in this really important region. Over to you, Chris. Hi. Um, yeah, my name is Chris Burrell. Um, I'm, the, I'm the early career researcher in the final year of my PhD um, at the University of St. Louis, Claire said. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the Ice and Greenland Seas Project and describe some of the ocean ice atmosphere interaction research that's coming out of this project. Um, so being one of the slightly lesser known Yop endorsed projects, uh, I'll talk briefly about the background into it, uh, motivation of the project, and then being aimed for early career researchers, I'll briefly talk about work collected data in the ship, and then I'll just highlight a few examples of um, different work coming out of this project. Um, here are the few of the key institutes involved in the project, but um, there, were, there were many more. So really, what is IGP? Uh, so the Atmosphere Ocean Project, encompassing wintertime observations and both one thing. And really, we're just trying to find out more about the fact that, um, that wintertime convection in Iceland Greenland Sea is forced by intermittent cold air outbreaks, forms the dent densest component of the Atlantic Meridian Internal Circulation, or AWOP. Um, I took part in the 40 day research cruise on the NATO Research Vessel Alliance, um, but we also had a science aircraft flying for 70 hours in the same region, um, and we deployed a meteorological buoy, ocean gliders, moorings, and Argo floats, so there's plenty of data involved. Um, so a few slides on the background, um, as you probably know, this region is uh, very important for deep water formation and inflowing warm salty water from the Atlantic uh, into this region and cools and flows from the outlet Denmark Strait. But as you might be able to tell from this chart here on the right, um, with some of these arrows having a, a no real ending or beginning, um, there are plenty of processes here that are not fully understood. And of course, cold air outbreaks, um, many of you know what cold air outbreak is, but it's a very important um, factor in this research because um, really where the, where the strongest gradients um, exist at the ice edge is where you get the largest transfer of heat and moisture into the atmosphere, um, causing rapid change in the boundary layer and associated with severe weather phenomena, uh, making it very important for forecasting. And from a climatological perspective, um, with sea ice declining in this region and ocean densification tending to be strongest near the ice edge, um, winter time um, sea ice and basically uh, convection depth, uh, well, sorry, uh, modeling suggests that further 
Further decreases in atmospheric force it will limit ocean convection depth, reduce the ventilation of mid depth waters, and reduce them ultimately supply of densest components to the Atlantic where going off over turbulent circulation. So next is just a few images of um, uh, showing a little montage of my life aboard the ship. Uh, at the top left panel, you see us launching weather balloons and collecting um, the data from them. Uh, this was one of my most important jobs on the ship, and besides launching weather balloons at least once or twice every day, um, during interest in observation periods, particularly cold outbreaks, we'd launch uh, three hourly weather balloons um, for as long as 24 to 36 hours, so we didn't get much sleep. On the top right panel, you see us debating how to <laughs> defrost the wind cube glider, um, which measures 3D dimensional wind profiles at a high temporal resolution. Um, the bottom left panel, you can see the LIDAR and the micro ray radar, which provides a measure of precipitation. And you see it covered in snow right there, so we're about to clear that off. And at the bottom right, you can see um, the HAPRO uh, radio, radiometer, which takes boundary layer profiles of humidity and temperature, also very high temporal resolution. Uh, required quite a lot of work to keep it working correctly, uh, as it was mounted on a motion correction table that in High, high sea state would sometimes lock out because it hit its maximum safe angle. So we'd have to get out there and reset it to make sure it kept running smoothly. Uh, in addition, we were responsible for relaying forecast to the Italian um, crew of the ship, which was uh, always fun and interesting. So if you want to learn more about it, uh, this is a great place to start. It's the overview paper in the um, Bulletin of the American Meteorological Society. Um, but to tell you a little bit about the work coming out of the project, uh, I've been largely involved in um, using the data we collected to evaluate the accuracy of error 5 uh, weather models in this region. Uh, as you can see here, the charts um, that I'm showing you uh, are really just showing how um, the products with their blurred uh, sea ice edge in, say, the Met UM or in error 5 um, result in a blurring of the sensible heat fluxes in this region, where in fact observations would show that um, a more sharp, clearly defined ice edge and sudden changes in heat flux in this region. Um, I wanted to highlight this paper by a, a colleague of mine, another early career researcher at the University of Bergen, who has led this work, um, improving that map I showed you at the start, identifying some of the key flows, particularly this ice and ferro slope check, um, which is, is great new work. And finally, some of my work where I've been focusing on uh, UK Met Office coupled models in development um, and I'm trying to show uh, in the top left here you can see the wind field uh, on two ocean model resolutions and due to the surface drag parameterization scheme being set too high we're seeing transport of too much ice um, towards the south and east of the region which is shown by the, the red areas over here on the right. So importantly if you want to go find out more about our project or um, or collect some of the data for your own use. Um, first place to go is the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution uh, web page for our project. Um, and there's plenty of data on there and yeah, media description and stuff. And then finally, um, if you want any of the atmospheric data and, and description about it, please go and find it on, um, on CEDA, UK's um, Atmospheric Data Centre. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks very much, Chris. Um, if anyone has any questions for Chris, then please do put them in the chat. I'm glad to see that the chat is uh, being used right now. Um, please do jump in and dive, because I think we're going to run out of time for much discussion at the end, so dive into the chat. Um, if anyone does have a question for Chris, then please uh, go ahead. Uh, in the meantime, I think I'm going to ask um, about your 40 days experience on a research vessel in the Greenland Sea. I, I see it looks like you spent a lot of time scraping snow off instruments. Uh, maybe you could tell us a bit more about what that experience was like. <laughs> yeah, well, I think um, really every day was a challenge, <laughs> but I loved it. It wasn't a lot of sleep, but um, the, the minute I would hear, uh, hear the ice scraping on the side of the ship, I'd be right out there. And, um, and it was always a, a pleasure to <laughs> tackle all the many challenges that we had. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the freezer wasn't too bad because unfortunately we had a lot of warm weather, but we did have a couple of um, really cold, uh, cold outbreak periods where we got a lot of good data and um, I've been <laughs> thoroughly analysing it for the years since. So, so yeah, glad, glad we sorted out those instruments at the time. <laughs> 
because I'm guessing there's not a lot of many uh, research cruises that go in winter to collect observations. Is that quite a rare data set that you've collected? Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, the, the, there's not a lot of uh, wintertime data, especially at sea, due to these rough conditions. And we were really fortunate that the ship we were in, um, despite not having a lot of experience in the Arctic, seemed to be really robust and have a really good uh, ability to keep doing science, even with the high sea states and, and heavy winds. So, we collected a lot of um, quite valuable um, data at the time when, as you say, um, not a lot of data is available. And um, also having the combination of the aircraft and the ship at the same time um, on a, at certain you know, interesting periods gives us like a really interesting picture of, of the atmosphere, the ocean um, in tandem. And we're working on some really interesting work right now trying to actually really look at the influence of the atmosphere on the ocean at very short time scales. With the, with the quite rare data, as I say. So. Well, then, thanks very much. Uh, so, your sister commented that uh, Marvin's data might eventually be available through the yacht data port. I guess that would be great. Um, I don't know if there is the ice and green and sea data also going to be made available through the yacht data port. Do you know? Um, yeah, I think that's um, been spoken about. Um, Ian Renfrew, um, who is leading, um, I think will definitely get it on there. Um, I'll chase that up with him and uh, <laughs> make sure that that happens because, as I say, plenty of data is already available online from the other data centres, so probably just needs to be linked up if it's not already there. Thanks very much. If anyone else has any questions, then please do add them into the chat. Um, but now I'm going to invite our next speaker, uh, Sebastian Becker from the University of Leipzig, who will give us an overview of another um, yacht endorsed project, Mosaic Airborne Observations in the Central Arctic. Uh, so this is another one of uh, making exciting measurements in the field, I think. Over to you, Sebastian. Okay. Let me share the screen. So we can see it all. Um, yeah, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm going to talk about the Mosaic ACA campaign, which took place uh, in August and September last year. So my name is Sebastian. I'm PhD student at the University of Leipzig in the group of Manfred Wendisch dealing with atmospheric radiation. And I'm also part of the AC3 project, the large German research project on Arctic amplification. And there I'm part of a sub-project which focuses on the radiative energy fluxes in the atmospheric boundary layer and the impact of clouds on these fluxes. As you know already from the title, this um, campaign is part of the huge mosaic um, expedition where the polar stand was frozen into the Arctic sea ice and thus one of the goals of the campaign was also to build a connection of course to polar stern um, to put the local mosaic measurements at polar stern into a regional context and that should be done by um, sampling with the aircraft the same air mass that once originated from polar stern or went into the direction of polar stern and that's why also there are always these trajectories here uh, been calculated to be able to study how these air masses um, change during their pathway. Another and for me more important um, topic or goal of the campaign was to study macro and microphysical properties of Arctic mixed phase clouds, such as the size distribution, particle shape, or liquid water content, and their influence on the Arctic turbulent and radiative energy budget and both over sea ice and over open ocean to study the differences between the surface types. Yeah, and together with other campaigns, which uh, were during different seasons before the Mosaic Aka campaign, also seasonal variability uh, could be studied from the measurements. To achieve these goals, of course, we need measurements and thus the Polar 5 aircraft from Alfred Wegener Institute had several instruments uh, to um, measure. So, to study cloud properties, of course, some of these properties had to be measured in situ, and thus there were these probes on the wings of the aircraft, um, which could um, derive the shape and size of particles and then retrieve the droplet size distribution. Um, other cloud properties also had been um, remote sensed, so by passive remote sensing for getting in, uh, integrated properties such as the liquid water path or active remote sensing get vertically resolved properties, so there were a radar and a LIDAR uh, fixed on the aircraft. And then to study the energy budget, we need further the radiative fluxes, which were measured by upward and downward looking uh, radiometers, and the turbulent fluxes, which were measured, or which can be retrieved by high resolution meteorological measurements here in the nose boom. And of course, there were standard meteorological measurements, and in total, 
60 drop zones uh, were released during the seven research flights which were done with the aircraft. And you can see all the flights here on the map. And these um, black dots here represent the points where the drop zones were released. So you can see most of flights went to the northwest of Svalbard and one also to the southeast of Svalbard. And the sea ice edge was quite far in the north during that season, so not all of the flights did reach the sea ice, but some of those most did. Um, yeah, that's mainly because of the aircraft endurance that all, always had to be considered during flight planning. So as the air, sea ice edge was quite far in the north, not all uh, flights were uh, able to get there. Yeah. That had, had to be to considered as well as the weather conditions and of course the different uh, purposes of the campaign and to satisfy all these a typical flight pattern looked like that so here you see a cross section through uh, through the, the flight track and on the y-axis is the altitude and this is a typical shape for the remote sensing part we use the high level flights uh, so clouds which are these Bluish and greenish parts here are remote sensed from above. In C2 measurements of course inside the clouds when they were penetrated. And um, the turbulent and radiative flux profiles were measured during such descents or ascents of the aircraft, as well as during such stack patterns where the cloud was sampled in different layers and also layers in between clouds. And then we have, of course, the surface turbulent and radiative energy budget which was started or sampled by these near surface legs. And these ascents, or descents, and then these patterns here were mostly done twice during the flights, once over sea ice and once over the open ocean, to be able to study also the uh, dependence on the surface type. Yeah, that leads me to first result, what I'm working with. So I'm studying the impact of the clouds on the radiative energy budget. So here it's the surface radiate energy budget which is referred to as cloud radiative forcing. And yeah, so we measure the radiative fluxes directly with the measurements in cloudy conditions. And hypothetically, um, cloud free conditions are then simulated by radiative transfer simulations. And then we get something like that for the whole campaign. And this is a frequency distribution of the cloud radiate, cloud radiative forcing. Um, in blue, the measurements over open ocean, and then the measurements over the marginal sea ice zone, so where also ice flows are present. And you can see over open ocean, the effect of clouds is mostly a cooling one. Um, so negative cloud radiative forcing values and over the marginal sea ice zone is mostly a warming one. And that's what I'm going to study in the future, why it is like that. And yeah, that I'm already at the end of my short talk and I would like to thank you for your attention and. If you want to have more information, please check also out uh, these links in this paper here. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sebastian. If anyone has any questions for Sebastian, then please pop them into the chat. I see there's quite some resources um, appearing in the chat right now, so please do look there if you want to have a look at uh, Thomas Fuckel's uh, TikTok visualization. And uh, it sounds like we can look forward to an article from Marvin in the Polar Prediction News soon. Um, so it's best, and I think uh, while people are thinking of a question, um, I just want to ask you, so you, were you on the flight um, that, to, that collected the data? Uh, yes, I was. So I was at the campaign at least, and I was once on the flights, but yeah, I got a little bit sick, so I was only once there, fortunately. Oh, I guess it's quite difficult if it's bad weather as well. But what Do you have to have very good weather conditions for the flights to be able to fly, or can, can they manage in... I guess September, there's great, not great conditions. Yes, yeah, what's in September, so it was quite challenging, quite a lot of times. So, yeah, sometimes it was precipitation or low clouds, which are um, hard to penetrate or to get in higher altitudes from the airport. Yeah, it was a little bit challenging, but at least we got seven flights and we were very uh, satisfied with that at the end. Thank you. Um, Moritz has put a question in the chat. Um, so he's asking, um, the CRF, does that address the ocean or ice surface or the top of the atmosphere? And um, that's the surface. That's now related to the surface, what I showed. So the forcing of the cloud related to the surface, at the surface energy, or for the surface energy budget, let's say. 
Thanks very much. So if anyone has any more questions for Sebastian, please do pop them in the chat. Um, um, but in the meantime, we'll move on to our next speaker. So we've heard quite a lot about uh, collecting quite challenging data sets to collect that are needed to improve numerical predictions. Our next speaker, Mario Lamas from the Environmental Policy Group of Vergenigan University in the Netherlands, is going to tell us a little bit about the challenges and opportunities of tailing environmental forecasting services to the diverse user needs across polar regions. And this is part of the work that's being done in the Salon Seas project. Over to you, Mahiel. Yes, I hope uh, that you can see me and that you can hear me. That's great, yeah. yeah. I see some nodding. Okay, excellent. My name is Magie Lamers and I'm an associate professor at Wageningen University in the Netherlands and also a co-chair of the of uh, the the CERA the group or the Social and Economic Research Applications Group of the of the Polar 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 Prediction Project. So I am a social scientist interested in these in these developments. Um, then, but then mostly from the yeah on, on the in in the ways in which uh, improved polar prediction is actually taken up uh, and is actually used by stakeholders and, and sectors uh, in the in the Arctic and also beyond. Uh, as I, and I will be uh, presenting about one particular aspect of this, and that is, well, how increasingly in, in projects that we do, uh, um, uh, you know, there, there, there's this, uh, this tendency, but also this, re this, this uh, requirement for, 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 uh, for, uh, for a co-production. So for working together and engaging with, with, uh, with sectors and actors uh, in these regions uh, to be working uh, on, the, on, the, on the development of services that are useful. And when you start looking at what this, this concept of, uh, of usefulness actually, actually, actually means, then you will start seeing that be, 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 between users and inf information systems, there are different ways in which you could look at this. First of all, there is usefulness. Uh, so the extent to, to, to which information actually meets, meets decision-making goals of actors. Then there is usability. Uh, which means whether the information is actually intuitive or can be implemented by actors uh, given their, uh, let's say, experience or, uh, or, or technical, technical literacy. And then there's also transferability. Uh, so is, is a user actually able to access the, the information through, uh, through an information system while, while up there? And, and this, for, for this for the polar regions is, of course, a, yeah, a typical and a, and a very important, uh, let's say, aspect as well. So we, this, the, this, this concept of user, of, of user needs, but also of, of, of uh, usefulness is, is actually um, yeah, has several dimensions, which makes that it's really important to take it, in, it into account. And typically, co-production co is a way in which we are trying to overcome some of these barriers. Uh, so um, it is typically from funding funding agencies that are increasingly re requirements made, but also in, in practice, uh, yeah, uh, let's say service developers are finding out that having having close contact or actively in, involving users in the um, in the production of of services helps to overcome these these barriers. So there's uh, in a way, a, a, let's say, kind of a a. Um, yeah, dichotomy in which you could say, uh, in, in, in which uh, different users can be engaged in at different levels. And this is not to, to say that the most, well, the most, uh, uh, let's say, profound level on the right there, the, in the uh, immersive level, is always the best thing to do in any type of, uh, of, of, uh, of project, uh, because this, of course, depends on many different, many different factors. And it is exactly these type of factors that, of course, we are, we we are interested in uh, so what makes sense in what type of of, of, of project or in what type of 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 of, of, of case so i will be presenting um, well like a little bit about the saliencies project which is uh, yeah, a project funded by the european union and the yeah, the uh, the uh, the jpi climate uh, the, the the joint planning initiative climate in which we have deliberately attempted to co-produce uh, marine climate services for actors in the in the Arctic with uh, with a range of different ac academic partners uh, and different different universities, but also the Danish and the Norwegian Meteorological Institute. 
uh, but also in uh, collaboration, in close collaboration with a range of different stakeholders. Uh, and these are, were associations of expedition cruising, of maritime, sh uh, maritime shipping, uh, but also of hunters and fishing associations in Greenland. So really different types of users of uh, CI services, because that is what we were, we were interested in most. And what we try to do in, in, in that project, um, based on this group uh, of, 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 of academics and of, of practitioners, they develop an, an iterative, iterative process whereby in different steps we would come back to these users uh, in different phases of the project uh, in order to learn and in order to adapt and to, um, and to um, well, adapt our goals and adapt our products accordingly to the interest and the needs of these, of these users. And so what you see here is we're, 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 we're basically different steps in which we were trying to find out what the, what the needs and um, what the information needs of these users are, uh, how, how different types of inf information are, are act actually used by, uh, by these users in the field. Um, and based on that, we, 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 yeah, we developed a range of demonstration services in order to, um, in order to, uh, uh, um, yeah, uh, to see how we could contribute to these settings. Uh, so first of all, we thought it would be really important to research these needs, these information needs in, in context, because this is, um, yeah, these contexts are very, very complicated typically, and it's not that in every part of, of a trip of a fishing vessel or of an expedition cruise vessel, the same type of information is needed. So we wanted to, to know precisely where, but also, also when a particular type of information or, or condition would be, uh, would be really valuable and you see that there are particular hotspots so to say eh? the southern tip of, of, of Greenland is, is such a, a hotspot for example but also the channels of, of, of Svalbard for the the expedition cruise sector for, for example at particular moments of the season have proven to be uh, very important in that respect and what you see then is what type of information these users need uh, you see on the in the bottom in the bottom part of this of this graph that it, that it is particularly the sea ice informations that 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 um, that are of use sea ice concentration sea ice drift and, and thickness these are really the types of information the three types that really well uh, the, the, the top three so to say that stand out for all these users um, uh, that we have that, <laughs> that that we have surveyed what we also did, of course, was based on these these demonstration services that we uh, that we that we developed, uh, subseasonal to seasonal sea ice forecast on the left, but also a range of of, of seasonality based, I mean of 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 of, of, of climatology based products, uh, an iceberg atlas. Uh, um, and also, uh, well, so fast ice climatology is, of course, particularly important for hunters uh, in, in, in Greenland. And, and we, of course, wanted to, to test those out in order to, to discuss yeah, which, which ones of these are, are particularly useful and how also uh, uh, yeah, the, the, um, the interface can be imp improved in terms of coloring, in terms of, uh, of information added, information taken away in order to make those, those services uh, most useful and immediately understandable for users. Uh, so, that, so that's what we did in several sessions, and um, what we also did, and that's another thing, more elaborate, let's say, social science uh, activity, is that we uh, that we also wanted to test, for example, these these uh, subseasonal to seasonal sea ice forecasting services developed by Matt Norway in this case, um, by bringing them. Um, uh, by bringing end users uh, uh, in interaction with these services in a well, in a contextually explicit way, and we did this in the form of of a gaming, uh, of a game that we that, that we developed, in which we basically let the end user, uh, uh, let's say, go through a uh, through a process of steps of of planning, and and executing a particular voyage, uh, in which they were they were confronted with particular conditions, and then we add these this inf information service to to sort of test, yeah, wh what difference that that makes in in the in the decision making, in order to learn. 
uh, both in order to improve the service, but also to, to also to learn about how information uh, that is not not that is not currently available uh, uh, would be used in the future in in a particular sector like this. Um, what is really yeah, what is what is really important there is that well the 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 debriefing sessions then are of course particularly important because these kind of exercises raise questions. So based on this, I have a number of lessons and considerations that I will leave here. Um, but maybe I could maybe take out just one or two things uh, that indeed indeed co-production is proving itself useful. Um, but yeah, a range of different things have to be taken into, into consideration because it, it can be done at, at different levels or in different ways. Um, uh, so, so sort of iteration and also ink, 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 and inclusivity of, of different users, flexibility are seem to be particularly important uh, in, this, uh, in this area. I think with that, I'll leave it and I'm here if there would be any remaining questions. Thanks very much, Michiel. Um, if anyone has any questions, please do pop them in the chat. Um, I might just ask a quick one before we move on to the next person. Um, what is the best way that um, information that is coming out of scientific projects can then be produ produced in such a way that is more use most useful to the user uh, community? Is that by making that part of the scientific projects or having other projects set up by, I don't know, by different nations or multinational projects? But what is the best way to approach that? Yeah, the best way is, I think, difficult to answer because there are, of course, uh, well, there are, of course, different ambitions. Uh, but in my view, it would be uh, it, it it would also not be my idea to to uh, yeah to necessarily involve in a very uh, sophisticated level end users in necessarily every science sci scientific project because not every every project yeah is suited for that. Um, uh, but that but that if if there's an, an ambition in a project to develop something uh, that, that is of use to, uh, to stakeholders, then it's really important to take this co-production seriously, right? Is to, is to not have it as a token, uh, let's say, aspect of, of a project, but to, but to, uh, to really give end users uh, this, this space uh, and, and also, do also the resources to be able to, to participate in a meaningful way. Thanks very much, Matthew. If anyone has anything else they'd like to ask them, please do add it in the chat. Um, but now I'd just like to invite our next speaker, Erin Thomas uh, from the Norwegian Neurological Institute. Um, and Erin is going to introduce some of the insights on lessons learned from the Nansen Legacy Project um, with a focus on her contribution of developing a couple of Arctic forecasting model. Thanks very much, Erin. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me. Can you guys all see this well? Yes, that's great. Perfect. Okay, so yeah, I will be talking about the Nansen Legacy Project, uh, which is quite a large project across many institutions. Um, and so, of course, everything I say here will just be from my perspective as a physical scientist doing Arctic forecasting. Um, and so the Nansen Legacy Project is a six year project. We're right in the middle of it right now. Um, and so it's gonna be ongoing for another three years here, really focusing on uh, the Arctic. In in particular, um, things going on in the Barents Sea. Um, and so here's a photo of the research vessel, the Crown Prince Hawkon. Um, and so a really large part of the Nansen Legacy Project is taking in situ observations in the Arctic via this uh, fancy new research vessel. And so there's quite a few different research categories. Um, here are five of the big ones. Um, so again, the Nansen Legacy Project is across many different institutions covering a whole lot of different processes in the Arctic. Everything from uh, the physical drivers to human impacts to forecasting what's going to happen in the future. Um, also a big component of uh, the Nansen Legacy Project is looking at um, ecological and um, biological systems. So the living Barents Sea. Um, and then lastly, um, there's a large emphasis on new technology and new method developments. Uh, and all of these um, research categories uh, are quite interactive with each other, which is really fantastic. 
And so uh, the Nansen Legacy Project is YAP endorsed. And so really the two research activities that are uh, most critical for YAP um, activities is uh, the physical drivers, which is focusing on uh, sea ice activity, um, how sea ice and ocean and atmosphere interact, uh, and all of the physical drivers uh, from large scale to small scale. Um, the other one that is really critical for YAP is uh, the future Barents Sea. And so this is the component that I do my work under. Uh, and we're working on forecasting the Barents Sea and the Arctic um, from time scales of days, so quite short time scales, all the way through centuries. Um, and so there's a lot of numerical modeling with weather, with sea ice models, um, a lot of hindcast modeling with ocean ice interactions. Um, fully coupled earth system models, so working towards more century uh, forecasts, um, as well as a lot of ecosystem and biological modeling. And so it's really exciting for someone like me, a physical scientist, to be able to directly interact with people who are, are interested in more um, physical uh, interactions with the biological systems. Uh, and so that's really one of the uh, benefits of a project like the Nensen Legacy, is you get so much cross uh, disciplinary collaboration between physical scientists like me um, and some of the biological scientists. And so um, again, I'll just focus a little bit on some of my contributions in the forecasting of the Arctic system. And so my work has all been to develop a coupled Arctic forecasting system uh, in order to advance short range forecast products uh, by representing the interactions between the atmosphere, the ocean waves and the sea ice. Um, but of course, all good model development and model verification really, really relies on good quality observations. And that's where a project like the Nansen Legacy uh, really excels. Uh, the Nansen Legacy has a really large component uh, focusing on in situ observations. And so uh, just an example, this was taken by one of my colleagues, uh, Malte Müller here at Met Norway, um, on the Crown Prince Haakon off the stern. Um, of a radio sound launch. Um, and so quite a lot of in situ observations um, from these cruises on the research vessel. And so um, my component again is developing a couple forecasting model. And so I'm really interested in how the atmosphere, ocean waves and sea ice interact. Uh, and so the coupled model I've developed incorporates Met Norway's Arctic forecasting model called Arome Arctic. Uh, as well as uh, the ocean wave model, Wave Watch 3. And so I won't go into any of the technical details, uh, but we are doing a uh, physical coupling through momentum primarily. Um, so wind, surface roughness, uh, and then sea ice interactions um, on the domain that you can see here on the right. So again, primarily focusing in uh, the Barents Sea around Svalbard and Northern Norway. And so uh, in order to uh, validate uh, any model developments, I need lots and lots and lots of good observations. And so I can use both conventional data sets, such as satellite observations. So I rely heavily upon um, 10 meter wind scatterometer data, as well as um, uh, significant wave height uh, me me measurements from satellites, um, as well as some land-based station observations. I can look at uh, surface pressure or winds. Um, but more importantly, being a part of a project like the Nansen Legacy, I get to use really unique in situ observations as well. And so uh, all of the cruises that um, the Crown Prince Hawkon has undertaken, uh, they have a bow mounted sensor uh, on the bow of the, the research vessel that is capable of measuring uh, waves uh, as the ship sails into and out of the marginal ice zone. So I get a really unique uh, observational data set in which I can validate uh, my coupled model against, um, which is fantastic and uh, unique to be part of um, such a, a great opportunity here. So um, one of the other really great um, things about being part of the, the Nensen Legacy. Again, another type of uh, in situ observational data set that I get to utilize um, is a, a, a 
a wave sensor that sits on ice flows. So again, these are deployed during uh, cruises off the Crown Prince Holcon. And so these wave sensors are drifting on ice flows, but measuring the waves. Um, and so really critical for a coupled model where I'm interested in the interactions between waves, um, sea ice, particularly within the marginal ice zone and the atmosphere. And so a couple really unique um, opportunities for a physical modeler like me, primarily interested, again, in uh, short-term weather forecasting, but of course, all of my model developments are really um, reliant upon validating against uh, in-situ measurements, which are hard to come by uh, in such a severe climate like the Arctic. Um, and so I guess I just wanna touch upon the, the primary lesson that I've learned um, is that with such a large diverse project like the Nansen Legacy uh, that encompasses many different institutions and many different kinds of researchers, um, the benefits of this cross collaboration between such a diverse research community all within the same project has been really fantastic. I've, I've gained so many benefits of being a physical scientist interested in the physical mechanisms, but I also get to interact with the people who are interested in the biological or the ecosystem responses to the physical um, environment that I'm interested in. So there's a lot of uh, cross collaboration and really good science coming out um, due to this um, collaboration between so many different um, different scientists. Um, and then again, as You're coming up for time. Been, sure, um, as has been mentioned before, the the really great um, interaction between observations and the modeling. And so if you're interested in learning more, I encourage you to check out the website. Thanks. Thanks very much, Erin. If anyone has any questions for Erin, then please do put them in the chat. Erin, um, I'd be interested to know, um, that bow sensor was quite interesting. Um, how, how much coverage of your model domain do you get with the ship board measurements? Are they going to one particular area or do you get quite good coverage? Um, and so, not very good coverage, unfortunately. It would be really great if we could deploy more of these um, floating wave on ice sensors, for instance. Um, and then, of course, as the as the ship goes sails into the marginal ice zone, you've only got a several point observations, and so it is very limited in terms of spatial coverage. Um, but some data is better than none, and these. Uh, wave measurements into the marginal ice zone are really unique. And so it's really worth having um, any measurement because it's very difficult to measure, uh, for instance, wave attenuation into the marginal ice zone from satellite-based observations. And so having any observations has really been a benefit. Thanks very much, Erin. If anyone has any more questions, then please do stick them in the chat. Uh, we're coming towards the end of our session now, but we do have time for last, but certainly not least, um, the chair of the Polar Prediction Steering Group, Thomas Yon from the Alfred Wegener Institute. Um, Thomas is going to bring together opportunities for early career researchers to engage with the, op with the OP community and find out how to make the most of available data sets and resources. Over to you, Thomas. Yeah, thank you very much, Claire. So I think for those who stuck all the way to the end, I have some insider tips here, okay, on early career opportunities. But before I go into this, perhaps the word, you know, the year of polar prediction in September this year will turn 10 years old, okay, with uh, six years of planning, and we are really sort of into the research that we have seen, you know, earlier this afternoon, you know, for the last three or four years, uh, but it took quite a bit of, uh, of planning. But I think, you know, it was fun, it's fun, and there are opportunities for you out there, and those I'm going to describe in the next couple of minutes. But before I do this, probably just a few words on why should you actually get involved with YOP, eh? and what, what would be the, the benefits for you? You know, I may be biased, but I, I, I would argue that they are exciting. It's an exciting topic with lots of potential. So, you know, if you understand though, the prediction problem, I think you are very well equipped for your career. You know, when it comes to growth of errors, you have to deal with things like instabilities. You will be exposed to things like modeling and not just the development of parameterization, but also increasingly computing, you know, activities in that area. 
When it comes to observations, you are thinking about optimality and you know where to measure, which is I think very educative. And um, you know you think about how to combine models and observations in something that's called data assimilation. And last but not least, it's about you know communicating and communicating uncertainty as well. Now we thought this is all extremely exciting, and again you know that is probably also one of the reasons why to you know engage with that topic. Now, I think Job provides a number of great opportunities, and we have seen opportunities in action during the last one and a half hours. You know, there are examples like data sets, and I will come back to one in a minute, but we have seen others before. Uh, and last but not least, I still believe that you know, having better predictions is useful for people, okay? not just in polar regions, but also beyond. I remember a study from Yun Inoue, basically, who showed a few years ago that by having extra observations in the Arctic, you know, you had more skill in, in predicting a typhoon, you know, uh, going past uh, Japan, you know, on the, you know, uh, medium range time scale. So how can you get involved? Well, there are two paths or maybe more perhaps, but, uh, you know, it's on the scientific side, obviously, but also when it comes to uh, networking and uh, communication. And again, the science bit, we have seen quite a bit. I would like to take the opportunity, though, to make advertisement for one data set that I consider very promising. That's something we call the ECMWF job data set. And there's a data publication here by Peter Bauer et al. in Scientific Data. You know, but this is probably one of the most advanced global models in the world at very high resolution and uh, you know, covering basically the last well, two and a half years, including the whole mosaic period. And you know, forecasts of the coupled system, atmosphere, sea, ice, ocean, and land. And on top of this, you know, you also have process tendencies like the one described by Marvin, you know, on the global scale, from the dynamics, convection, cloud scheme, turbulent diffusion, and so forth. And I, if I would be an early career scientist in that field, you know, I would certainly work with that with that data set. And uh, you know, perhaps some of you are interested, but there are more, and uh, you know, I show you where to find out more in a minute. When it comes to engaging and connecting with the community, you know, please join us in our you know social social media community. Feature your work with Yop. Um, I think it helps you increasing the impact of your research. Okay, so you know by featuring this as part of our outreach activity, I think you get exposure. In turn, of course, we are very happy in you contributing because you know you strengthen the the activity. So you know, it looks like win win uh, uh, to me. I should say, in terms of opportunities, there are two immediate ones coming our way. We are currently uh, planning a, a, a summer school. Well, it's probably not a summer school, but it's a, it's a winter school, rather, in February and March 2022 in the north of Sweden in Abisko, where the topic will be polar prediction, and that will be advertised soon. And uh, that's something, an activity that Claire is, uh, is chairing and, and co-leading as well. And there will be the opportunity for you to, you know, to, you know, to, to go onto the ice, to measure, to talk with modelers, with social scientists. So I think it's a, it's a great opportunity and, you know, and information on that should soon be distributed. And then there will be the Yop final summit in May 2022. And we, we are launching, um, again, you know, Claire is, uh, is co-leading this. Um, uh, we're letting, uh, launching a fellowship program, so very promising, you know, PhD, you know, uh, sort of early career scientists, they, they will be invited to apply for a fellowship, and we are planning to have something like five in total, you know, very prestigious, you know, and, you know, gives you exposure at the summit, you know, a bit of a program on the site and a certificate. And uh, so, you know, that is something we are going to announce fairly soon as well. And, you know, for some of you, it might be actually interested to engage in that competition. And I guess, you know, being, you know, playing an, an active role in, in, in running and uh, that, that summit might be actually quite an interesting to some of you. So, uh, and then uh, for staying informed on your progress, probably one of the first things I would do is that to, to subscribe on your mailing list. I've seen that already one has done this during the session, so I hope there is more to come, okay? But the mailing list is not everything, you know, we do have our website, um, you know, Twitter, you know, and you can make it 2,000 followers today if you all subscribe and ask your friends to subscribe as well, and Kirsten will be happy, I'm sure about this. But there are other things as well, and, uh, you know, if you are interested in engaging, if you're interested in this fellowship program and the school, the Polar Prediction School, then again, you know, these are the things to follow, and then you will, and will be informed and, uh, you know, and, uh, and can contribute. So I'm, I'm looking forward to you know, seeing some of you perhaps 
in different uh, occasions related to the EF polar prediction. Thanks. You are muted, Claire. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much, Thomas. Uh, thank you for advertising all the upcoming um, activities that we have. Um, I'd just like to note that Kirsten has also added in the chat that yes, she's definitely uh, looking forward to contributions from everyone for the uh, newsletter and for the um, for the poll predict prediction matters as well. We also have the blog. Um, if anyone has any final questions, then please do stick them in the chat. We have slightly run over, but thank you very much, ASSW 2021, for your patience with us slightly running over. Um, I'd like to say a really big thank you to all the speakers today. Um, thank you for sticking to your time. We had a very full session, um, but I think a very interesting session. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Anna and Ruta, who've been here helping us with tech support. Um, the uh, recording of this session will be available on the APEX website, and we will make that uh, known through the social media channels. And I'd like to encourage you all to please, yes, do uh, uh, have a look on the Polar Prediction website and do sign up onto our various social media channels. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>